What's the worry, y'all? Welcome back to Called Game. I would say that today's slate of games was the best slate of games we've had in an individual day. And maybe that's just me being being crazy, but I feel like every single game has something in it that we should talk about, so we will. It's a bittersweet episode because my Bulls called an L in the game. They probably should have won at the hands of the homie. I love to see the homies be successful, but why does it have to be against my team? I told y'all when Reese was on, on the show, uh, I was telling y'all how much of a seal of a draft he was, and he is showcasing it. You remember a couple episodes ago, I was saying, man, the, the Kings don't look too fun no more. Well, that's because Tyrese wasn't there, and today he was there, and he was making all the right plays. It's a game the Bulls should have won because De'Aaron Fox got injured like five minutes into it. Whatever. We catch an L. Congratulations to the homie on having a career night, first of very, very many. Uh, be sure to leave a like on the video. Subscribe if you're new. We do nothing around here but talk about basketball, you know, call game. Let's get into it. I don't know where I really want to start. Maybe let's start off from the top. Um, we had a bunch of games started. Now, I will admit it right now, there are going to be a few games in this slate that I didn't get around to watching. It's just the art of things. I can't focus on four games starting at the exact same time. You hear me? So I'm, I'm tuning in when things get close and everything. Start off with Pacers versus Rockets. I don't really have much to say about the Rockets because we just don't know what the Rockets look like in two months, three months. So I don't want to deep dive into their their slow start other than like there was periods in this game where they Sabonis and Miles Turner on the court and they were going back with their ultra small ball lineup because Christian wasn't wasn't there and, and Boogie don't look great so far so they were going ultra small against two a, a team that usually basically runs two centers let's be honest they run like two centers I want to say that Miles Turner bro give him all the love man because I'm not even just talking talking counting stats because I think he ended with eight blocks on the day not even just talking counting stats when he is on the court the team is just dramatically different that, that was the eye test saying that and I went up to looked at the numbers and yes they are dramatically different when he is on the court and off the court defensively like when it's just like Sabonis at the five the team gets toe up but when Miles Turner's there with him, man, he just makes things a lot easier. Um, Malcolm Brogdon, for the second episode in the row, I got to mention how great of a player he has been throughout the first couple weeks into the season. I remember I was talking about how he was having an all-star type season so far, and people were in the comment section like, what about Sabonis? Just forgetting the fact that, you know, it's not like one all-star per team. Again, I don't want to talk too much about the Houston Rockets, but shout out to the Pacers continuously going out of the radar throughout the entire existence of the Indiana Pacers. At least as I've been an NBA fan, they go into the radar, go into the radar, they hit the playoffs, and then sometimes they make surprise and things like taking LeBron and the Cleveland Cavaliers to a game seven. And sometimes they just they don't do things like that, whether it be through injury or whatever. But you gotta admit that even with the big injuries from from like TJ Warren. They've weathered the storm, and they look really good. I already mentioned that Markel Fultz went down with the injury. I swear to God, the moment Markel Fultz went down in the injury and then they cut to commercial and cut back and they was putting him in a wheelchair, I cut the game off. I didn't watch a single second left of this game. And and I feel bad because Mavs fans have been – I mean, Mavericks fans have been hitting me up. Kenny, please talk about us. Please talk about us. I can't get myself to do it, especially after that. It just killed my whole mood until I got to the next game. This is what y'all are here for. Let's talk about Bradley Beal's 60-point game. Um, I had made a tweet. It was like six minutes left in the third quarter. He had 49 points. And at that point, the team was down by like 16 points. And I was just like, I just, I just feel bad for him, right? Um, and I, I know the title may something say something along the lines of free Bradley Beal. I'm, I don't want to see him switch teams per se, but I'm just saying that like if he were to come out tomorrow morning and say that he requested a trade, then not, there better not be a single person that disagree with his decision. The man has given the Washington Wizards everything throughout the first couple of years of his career. I like the idea of people being loyal to the team that drafted him, but you can only be too loyal to the point where you're, you're, you're wasting part of your career because there's no – construction to this roster right they made the Russell Westbrook trade I'm not I'm not about to talk about that trade again because no matter what you say about Russell Westbrook there's going to be Westbrook haters in the comments saying something or there's going to be Westbrook stands in the comments saying something and honestly both of them end up wrong 90% of the time so I don't want to really talk about Westbrook but like outside of that the the construction of the team is just bad the real really weird thing for me is to see that Isaac Baga didn't get any PT. He started like the first five games of the season for them, and then now he's getting DMP coach's decision, and I think Scott Brooks was asked about it, and he didn't even answer the question. So I don't know what's going on with Isaac Bonga, Isaac Bonga, but he is one of the players that I would want to see alongside Riley Beal because he brings that defense. There is no reason for a team to give up 141 points of regulation. Now, I'm not saying it's just to watch the Wizards doing this because we've seen it a few times throughout the season already, but even those teams, there's no excuse to give up 141 points. To give up, to, to put up 60, and shout out to Ben Simmons for fouling him so he can get his 60 piece. Good guy, Ben Simmons. Um, 
to put up 60, you can see the disgust in his face. And I saw that last year when he put up 50-something against my Bulls. And when he was sitting on that bench, you saw the disgust in his face. There's nothing he wants more than to win. And he can't do that at the moment. And it's just just the construction of this team. It's bad coaching, how Scott Brooks took him out of the game and basically made him cold. He sat for way too long. Let's be real. He sat way too long. And I want to give a lot of credit to the 76ers for eventually it took him three and a half quarters or maybe even four quarters to, to actually play the great defense on him. But part of that could be Scott Brooks sitting here for way too long, man. You know, just just way too long. And I, I saw a statistic, and this is just a weird statistic that I just feel like everything is tracked in the NBA, that um, Russell Westbrook is two for six when he throws alley-oops. Who the hell is tracking alley-oop percentage? It's a real thing. He is two for six, and there's a specific play where, where Bradley Beal was wide open under the basket. And instead of giving him a nice chest pass or a bounce pass, Russell Westbrook, Russell Westbrook decided to throw the oop. And it ended in a turnover. And it's like, bro, just give him the ball. Just give him the ball. So I could see the disgust in his face. Um, there's times where the team was taking shots. You could just see it like he was demoralized because he deserved that shot. You know what I'm saying? But on the other side of things, the 76 or 71. Joel Embiid is so amazing, bro. I think at the end of the first quarter, Joel Embiid didn't have a field goal. And he ended with almost 40, y'all. He is he is playing differently. He is you, – you can tell that he's just – I don't want to say he's more in shape because that that couldn't that may not be the case, but it's something about him that is different this year than last year. Last year he said his objective was to win MVP and win Defensive Player of the Year, and he didn't come out with that same energy. He's coming out with that energy so far this season. At least I don't know about – the team is the best defensive team in the league other than today giving up 136 points to a, a relatively bad team. Um, but the team is great offensively, and a lot of that is due to Joel Embiid. So shout-out to the 76. Shout-out to JoJo. Both of them – I said it in the last episode. Both of the top two centers in the league have my MVP. MVP ballot. If I had three picks, two of them are getting it. Um, next, we want to talk about the Atlanta Hawks falling on another game, and um, they they fall into four and four. The weirdest game I've seen of Trey Young's career since the early start of his rookie season, where he's seen timid. He's seen. I don't want to say the word scared because I I can't. Trey Young is not scared of anything. It's just this is he's proven that throughout the, the two years of his career so far. Um, but in this game specifically. It seemed like he just completely changed up his way of basketball. Um, the little flip up, draw foul things, I know people hate it, but that had, throughout the first couple games of the season, that had been a part of him and a part of the Atlanta Hawks' success. And in today's game, I mean, I don't know, did he finish with less than 10 shot attempts? If he, There's no reason a guy of his caliber, of his offensive caliber, to end with less than 10 shot attempts and a three to seven turnover ratio—that is ridiculous, Trey Young. There, I don't. There's no excuse for that. I'm sorry. There's literally no excuse for that. I don't care who's defending you. And it's not like the the Charlotte Hornets had Lou Dort. You know what I'm saying? They, they don't have the the defenders. To, I don't know. He's got to be in his own head. Um, there's no excuse for that one. There's just no excuse for that one. Um, for the Charlotte Hornets, I I understand Devonte Graham was their guy last season, but I'm 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 not even a fan of the team. But I'm getting tired of seeing him in that game. When he's having the bad, when like the last couple games, look at his game log, please. He is getting maximum starter minutes when he is not performing to that caliber. LaMelo only playing 20-something minutes in this game is kind of criminal considering how good he had been in those 20 minutes when Devontae Graham is getting 40 minutes when he can't score a basket. Shout out to, to Gordon Hayward for having his best game as a Charlotte Hornet, but there has to be a point. Well, LaMelo is getting more minutes than that. And listen, I'm not a LaMelo lover, hater, or whatever. I'm just telling it how it is. He deserved more minutes than the 23 he got today, especially when the guy that he's playing under is playing like trash. It just is. Uh, Trey Young, I don't know. I'm guessing that we're going to get a bounce back game, but this is a couple really bad losses for them. A couple really bad losses for them. And I understand all the injuries they have, but still, this is this is, this is is not a game they should have lost. Oh, Boston versus Heat. I'm telling you, it was just so much great basketball today. Boston versus Heat um, is one of the better ones, even though the Boston Celtics almost gave it away. They were thi this close. And I feel like I've said that a lot. But it's the third game out of their nine games that ended in a buzzer beater, a game winner. And today it was Peyton Pritchard. He is just becoming um, – he's going to be the all-time leading – Jersey seller in Boston Celtic history by the time his career is over because he is just everything that the Boston Celtics fans could have wanted. Um, <laughs> just, just everything. Interpret that how you want. He's everything the Boston Celtics fans could have wanted. And there's no excuse for um, as good of a run they were trying to put together, talking about the Miami Heat with Duncan Robinson hitting his threes late in the game, that they give up that many offensive rebounds that they gave up in the last couple minutes, especially to the guy that is 6'1", 6'2". 
Peyton Pritchett had a couple big offensive rebounds this game, and none bigger than, than the tip. I mean, this is one of the better games for the Miami Heat. I'm not going to be one of those people that's saying everything that they did in the bubble is fraudulent. Um, this is one of their better games, one of the best Jimmy Butler games of the season. I think they're still trying to put together the rotation because Eric Spolster doesn't want to start going Dragic. And the one thing that was really weird in this game that I don't know how often he's done it this season because I'll be honest with you, I've been hit or miss with the Heat game so far where I saw a lot of minutes with Tyler Hero and Goran Dragic on the court together and I'm just going to say that is a recipe for disaster defensively and in those minutes, I don't know what the statistics say, but I test told me that they were getting dominated. Um, so I don't I don't know what the rotation looks like. Kendrick Nunn get minutes eventually? I, I don't really know. It's crazy that he went from an all-rookie team player he was looking like potentially the rookie of the year early last season to get in DMP coaches' decisions very, very quick. The Knicks get another quality win in the Utah Jazz, and and Rudy Gobert get dominated two games in a row. This is as bad as it could get for, for Rudy Gobert. He is down bad. I, I know the stat line says 14, 12, and 5. I ain't feel that because Julius Randle was giving that boy buckets, putting his shoulder down, getting in Rudy Gobert's chest, and dominating him. And Julius Randle, it's not an efficient night. But dominate it. Is that possible? Yes, it is. And Austin Rivers to come off the bench, and it's the same thing that I mentioned last time we talked about the Knicks, how Tom Thibodeau was going to roll out with our best guys. In this case, it was Austin Rivers instead of RJ. RJ was on the bench, and one thing I love to see, and you don't see this often, a guy like RJ on the bench when you know he could he could be super upset that he's not closing out the game. He was on the bench, geeked up for Austin Rivers. That is teamwork. That is a team. New York is putting it together, a quality win for them. And I can say the same thing today as I said about the Utah Jazz yesterday's episode, that they have these periods of time where they literally can't score, where the offense is give Donovan Mitchell the ball, and if Donovan Mitchell can't put it in the basket, then I guess we don't score for four possessions. It's, it's, it's bad. Um, the Bucks game, I literally didn't watch a second of, and that's kind of been the recipe for me for the Bucks because I just I just assume that they're going to dominate. But it says that Jeremy Grant hit 30. I'm going to have to watch that eventually. Let's talk about a couple games left. Utah versus the Pelicans. Um, people have been really misinterpreting my opinions on – I didn't even realize that my hat looked that bad for 12 minutes. Uh, people are misinterpreting – my opinion on like the Steven Adams trade and the Steven Adams signing. So so let me let me pull it out there and, and really full fledged tell you guys. When they made the trade for Steven Adams, I was completely confused because the idea of having Steven Adams and Zion Williamson play together just I think is a recipe for a lackluster offense. Not saying anything negative about Steven Adams, not saying anything about negative about Zion, but as a pair offensively, it, on paper, it did not look like it was going to work. And what happened, I'm not just saying for today, but what has happened for a lot of these games this season, the spacing is terrible and they have no shooting. Steven Adams had one of his best games as a part of this team and it didn't matter because when it, when the, when the, when the things were going down, they didn't have any space. And not to mention J.J. Redick went out and he is their spacing. So it, it resulted in the kill Alexander Walker having to be that spacer and, and, and Lonzo having to be that spacer and they couldn't perform there. Right? I understand that when Zion and, and Steven Adams on the court together defensively, they dog the glass. They're, they're good. But you also have to score. And they haven't been able to do that with this lineup. That's all That's all I was really saying. That's all I was really saying. The people were trying to take it as me taking shots at the, at the team. It's not. It, I'm not taking shots at the team. It's just a fact that, I, I mean, I would guess that the numbers support me here. You're not going to win. Let's be honest. You're not going to win a basketball game when you hit four three-pointers. You're not. Very rarely will you. And this is a team that you should have beat. Um, shout out to Darius Basie. He's putting it together, y'all. He's putting it together throughout the season. Shea Gill just playing the passing lanes like a madman, and they got George Hill doing his thing. Um, last possession, Lou Dort putting the clamps on Brandon Ingram, getting the ball out of his hands and relying on the key Alexander Walker to make a shot. That's great defense. But, yeah, I don't know what the recipe is for the, for the Pelicans because obviously they are talented enough to be a playoff team, 100%. They have a lot of talent on this team. But they got to figure out the spacing thing because it's hard to watch, for one. It just is. It just is. I mean, Lonzo Ball started off the game pretty solidly and then ended up terrible because they were just allowing him to shoot. Um, the last game, I didn't really watch much of Suns Raptors. I don't have anything to say about the Raptors that I haven't already said in an episode. I, Pascal heard y'all talking, and I guess he had a good game, but it didn't matter because they still lost. And then the Bulls, briefly, again, I think I mentioned at the top of the show, Tyrese absolutely killed us. I still don't understand the drop coverage on the pick and roll for Wendell Carter. And this is also something that Stacey King has said on the Chicago Bulls call. He doesn't defend the pick and roll like anybody else on the team. So if, you want, if you're a Bulls fan, please pay attention to the way Wendell Carter defends the pick and roll and compare it to when we're small ball and Thaddeus Young in the game or when Daniel Gafford is in the game. 
Um, and the, the turning point of this game, or maybe not the turning point of the game, but the, one of the most crucial possessions is when it was a pick and roll with Buddy Hield. Gary Temple was guarding him. And, and Wendell Carter was so deep under the rim that Buddy Hill was getting such an open look and Garrett Temple fouled him from behind. Like, we should be able to get a hand up on, on those three-point attempts. And the same thing happened in the game against the, the Trailblazers where we won. Luckily, CJ and Dame couldn't hit those shots. But those are such good looks for elite shooters like Buddy Hill, Dame, and CJ, you know? Um, but overall, still bad loss for the Bulls. I talk about the full slate of games. I don't know how many games that was. A lot of them. I'm sorry for the games that I didn't get to, but you you know, you just can't watch every single game. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave it a like, subscribe if you're new. I'll see y'all soon. Call game.